What is up? Hello, IBS 2021. My name is Christine Williamson. I'm joined here by Tim Euler, and we are here to give a presentation called Construction Myths Busted, in which we will talk about the most common misconceptions that we come across in our daily practices. Me as a building scientist, Tim as a framer, and um, take you through the ins and outs of what makes the, the nuggets of truth that the myths are usually based on and then the crazy lengths that they go that are not based in science or reality that she should be careful about. Um, with that, I'm going to turn it over to Tim to introduce himself. Hi, IBS. I'm coming live from the job site just west of Seattle here in the beautiful state of Washington between raindrops today. So I get asked a lot of questions on Instagram primarily. I've been writing for the Journal of Light Construction since 2003, uh, written for Fine Home Building this year. And so people have a lot of the same questions. So I'm really happy to be here with my friend, Christine. We're gonna cover three myths that we get probably the most common. And those myths are myth number one, overdriven fasteners are really, really bad. Myth number two, Tapes are not good for long-term water management. And myth number three, reverse laps are an enormous problem. Now, all of these are based on some kind of kernels of truths and half-truths. But as you might expect in our industry, there's a lot of nuance that comes into play with all of them. So let's start with the one we probably get the most often, uh, overdriven fasteners. And I like to divide the potential answer to this question into three areas of concern. So there are three reasons why overdriven fasteners are potentially bad. The first reason is that they contribute to poor water management. The second potentially bad reason uh, the potential bad thing is that overdriven fasteners are structurally risky. And the third potentially bad feature is that they are the result of careless installation. And we're going to talk about all three of these because because the reasoning behind each of the three sort of reasons is a little bit different. And uh, between us, we, uh, we have a good experience in these areas together. So with that, let's actually handle them in, in reverse. I talked about water management, structure, and careless installation. But let's draw on some of your experience, Tim, to talk about uh, that last one. Are overdriven fasteners really the result of careless installation? What do you view in your experience as an excellent framer and throughout your experience in the industry? What do you view as sort of normal expectations, abnormal expectations? How do you get an overdriven faster? How do you avoid it? I just asked you like a ton, a ton of questions there, but take it away. Yeah, I would say that every framer out there overdrives fasteners at some point. And the reason for that is we're using pneumatic nail guns and the material that we're shooting into is not uniform. It's not perfect. There's different densities, things like that. So depending on the time of year, it could be pulled out. Uh, a particular nail gun isn't necessarily as consistent as we wished it was. You're trying to be as productive as possible. So you put all of those things together and you're going to get some overdriven fasteners. Now, could you avoid this if, like, if we went back to hand nailing everything, would that be one way of avoiding overdriven fasteners? Yeah, yeah. And then we would age out of the trade much earlier, <laughs> like all the guys that trained exactly. me. Yeah. No, you could. If, if we were hand nailing everything, but that's not productive, you, you know, it, right. prices would go up, et cetera. So you could do it perfectly if we were in a nice climate controlled environment, we got to work from waist height and we could take all the time in the world, we could dial it in right on the money. So uh, what do you see on your job sites? I know that there's some, you can, you can back off, you can adjust the pressure on your nail gun. Uh, when you see that you're overdriving some fasteners, you can back it off. You can, how, do you, are, you, are you constantly adjusting in the field? Yeah, and that's one of the things that can really drive us nuts is you could be up and down from like, I'm on the second floor here, but I could go down to the compressor and constantly be dialing it in. You have to find a happy medium. And, and then you can adjust on the gun. But what we find is, is we get it to where the vast majority 
are either perfect or underdriven, where we have to finish them off with a hammer. And then after that, you just know that there's a certain percentage that are just going to be overdriven. You do your best, but that's just life. And this happens with any, like, any kind of sheathing product that you're using. It doesn't matter what system you're using. Yeah, there's I mean, we've used... Overdrive it happens. Plastic. Yeah, yeah. Exactly. It, it happens when you're shooting on subfloor. It, it's OSB or plywood. It's just, that's just the fact of life. You do your best, but the reality is there will always be some unless we hand them. So uh, with that, I think that's a good lead into the other two kind of potential contributors. So having, having a certain amount of overdriven fasteners is is not indicative of careless installation overall. Although I've certainly seen job sites, I'm sure you have as well, where it's like, were they trying to make a big mess of this? And even though I liken this to cleanliness on a job site as well, where I can tell how well somebody's windows are flashed by how clean their job site is a lot of the time. So it's not, I, I view pervasive overdriven fasteners as, a, as an indication of careless workmanship. Um, but uh, uh, the, the odd overdriven fastener is an indication that we're using efficient building strategies. Yeah, and I, I, and I would say, that, so here west of Seattle, we have to deal with earthquakes. That's what we're designing for. That's what we're framing for. And mentally, that's always my mindset is I don't want somebody to be in a building that I did a bad job. And then maybe there, there's significant damage down the road. So I've been framing on the job during an earthquake. I think it was a six point something oh. back in 2001 or 2002. And, you know, the whole house is moving. It, it was scary. So I always try to drill into the guys. You have to. I don't want you to be a perfectionist. It's just not possible. We still have work to get done but I want you to go slow enough that the great majority of nails are just fine. And if there's 5% that are overdriven, you know, we can deal with that. Now, and actually that leads into the, the second potential area of concern is are overdriven fasteners structurally risky? And I think that, I mean, we don't have to guess at this. We, we know the answer to this. We know that, yeah, they, they, if you pervasively, ignore how you should be mechanically fastening the components of your building together. That's a really bad thing. But there's, um, I get asked this so much on Instagram and structure isn't really my specialty. So I was forced to do some, some research on the structural component uh, in order to respond to, to some of these questions. And was so, I suppose I shouldn't have been surprised that the incredible body of reference material that we actually have for this, where there are tables uh, that tell you how much structural performance is weakened based on how much, like how far overdriven a fastener is and how many are overdriven. Uh, do you refer to those guides a, a, a bunch? Yeah, yeah, because the same question comes up for me on Instagram quite a bit is um, uh, usually our nailing spacing is six inches on the edge, 12 inches in the field, unless it's a heavy shear wall. But we've never failed a shear inspection because we'll try to be a little bit more conservative and maybe we'll go five and 10. It's better to have a couple more nails than a few, too few. But there's a great APA technical note on what percentage of the nails can be overdriven and by how much. And our inspectors, they're, they're trained on that. We teach the guys that as we go through. Yeah. Uh, so, yeah, I I found it uh, helpful when I when I was doing my research on this for my structural engineering friends to tell me, remind me that yes, this is something that matters, but this it matters in the context of the entire structural system for the building itself. These, and this is of course that's natural, right? That's we're building the whole, we care about the whole building, not any one component of it. And that things like panel orientation and how close you are, like nailing pattern, how close you are to the edge of panel are actually more significant contributors than whether or not uh, any given faster is overdriven or not. So the answer to that part of this myth is like, yeah, it does matter, but it doesn't matter. It's not a pass fail 
uh, a black or white type of thing. There's, um, there's some forgiveness that we design into our systems and it matters in conjunction with the whole rest of the structural, uh, the whole rest of the structural design as well. Yeah, I found that for us, when it comes to like shear inspections, it's the nail size, it's the nail spacing, it's the panel thickness. And generally speaking, okay. it's really easy to fix if we're overdriven. It just means we add nails next to the ones that are overdriven. So it's really nice that you can kind of go a little faster. And if you got a little sloppy, you can very quickly make up for that on the structural side. Well, this leaves us with one, the, the kind of biggest area of concern that I see expressed re related to overdriven fasteners, and that's being a poor water management in, um, in buildings. Overdriven fasteners contributes to poor water management and is risky for that reason. And what I think is sort of interesting about that component is that that, that part of the myth is based on a fundamental misunderstanding of how walls manage water. And the, um, the funny thing I think about that is that the overdriven fastener issue by itself, I mean, in the grand scheme of things, is really not that big a deal for most buildings. It's more of a, the myth itself is more of an irritation than anything else. But the reason I think it's really important that we're talking about this today is that the bad physics, moisture management physics, upon which this myth rests ends up being a lot more destructive in our industry and it leads to a whole host of other more serious problems. So what do I mean by that? Uh, there are three different kinds of walls, each with a different water management strategy. So I, I think it'll help to, to go through these three different, three different strategies because it's really, you'll, you'll see how this plays out. So if we start with mass walls, so if we think about like a castle, what happens with mass walls is they get wet and they just slowly dry in both directions. We've historically built like this for a very, very long time. It's expensive, it's labor intensive. Mass walls are heavy. Um, we also continue to build this way in for certain types of buildings and in different, different parts of the country, even in North America. It's very common to have uh, a masonry wall as the, the first floor in um, Florida, for example. We just put a stucco render right over it. And these walls work because they have, for, for two reasons, they have a tremendous ability to store and redistribute water. They're massive. So they've, they've got a big capacity to hold water which they can safely do as they dry. Uh, and then the second reason they work is that they're not made out of moisture sensitive materials, right? It's, it's stone. So we're usually in pretty good shape. Uh, now, it doesn't mean we don't need to worry about water management with mass walls. We do different kinds of things like source control and we design the facades to be water shedding. We have drips and perfs and all kinds of details. But that general approach is storage and slow drawing in both directions. The second kind of wall is a, a drained wall. And this is what we do mostly in North American construction. And what, what it lets us do is it lets us build with lightweight, moisture sensitive materials uh, that, that really can't, they don't have the same water holding capacity that our, our stone castle does. Uh, but what we do is we allow them to, we have a water control layer somewhere in those walls. And, um, and then we allow them to drain. We provide drainage in front of that water control layer. Uh, and that's predominantly how we build in North America. It's an unbelievable stroke of genius really that we build this way it's so cool it allows us to build much much more efficiently and less expensively with a broader array of building materials which is really really clever it's a great innovation but it relies on a wrb some sort of water shedding component and drainage um, the third category of wall is a perfect barrier wall and that's as the name implies it needs to be 
totally impervious to water. So think about like the Apple store or curtain wall systems work like that or commercial um, like metal panel. So some metal panel system, insulated metal panel systems work like that. But that's the most, uh, it's usually inappropriate for most construction because most of the time, the materials that we're building with don't lend them very well, that lend themselves very well to perfect barrier construction. So three types, we've got mass walls, drained walls, perfect barrier walls. The vast majority of our walls are drained walls. And how this relates to overdriven fasteners is that uh, we end up mistaking one of these strategies for another strategy. So the overdriven faster myth confuses, confuses these strategies for, for one another. It treats every wall like a perfect burial, barrier wall. And then any additional measures we take to permit drainage and drawing, we understand that as, as backup for when we failed in some way. And that's not true. No one thinks that you've done anything wrong when you go fill the bathtub up to have a bath you have your bath, you drain the bathtub, and then you fill it up again when you want to have another bath. Like there's, it's designed to work that way. It's not, the, the drainage is part, of, is part of the system. So providing drainage doesn't mean we've failed. It means we've succeeded. And what have we succeeded in doing? We've succeeded in building lightweight, inexpensive walls out of moisture sensitive materials in an efficient and durable way, which is totally awesome. It's kind of like your, your point, Tim, earlier about uh, we get overdriven fasteners as the result of a tremendous efficiency by switching from hand nailing to nail guns. So the, the efficiency and the, the genius comes with some, okay, but now we have to pay attention to these other things. And with respect to walls, that means accounting for drainage. So overdriven fasteners are, tend not to be a problem in walls that are, really, that, are, that are well drained. So we have to pay attention to the design of the whole wall, not just the, the individual, individual fastener. So you're telling me I'm not supposed to be building a submarine? Exactly. And actually, it's sort of funny you bring up the submarine example because now I'm not a naval expert of, of any sort, but you know what I notice on pretty much every boat? They have bilge pumps. They also, I think the most, the craziest submarines in the world, they like x-ray all the seams and all that stuff, but you know what else they have? Um, a lot of them have double hulls. So they're sort of I mean, they're borrowing from our drained walls, obviously. Just like us. <laughs> Nuclear submarine designers, building design. Just, just imitated your wall design, yeah. That makes <laughs> That's, <perfect> right. Sense. <laughs> That's right. That's right. <laughs> now, I think it actually helps to get into even more of the specifics here beyond taking baths and, um, and talking about submarines. It is also true that we have failures with drained walls. And a failure occurs when we exceed that wall's ability to store and redistribute water for long enough to cause materials to decay. And when we build with moisture sensitive materials, sometimes that's early, right? They can't get, we don't have a lot of forgiveness there. So the, the question really is, does the amount of water that leaks or potentially leaks through an overdriven fastener cause that kind of damage? And the answer is most of the time, no. Um, to have a leak, we need four things and we need all four of these things. We need a source of water. We need a pathway for water. We need a driving force pushing water along that pathway. And then we need something to be damaged as a result. Now the Overdriven fastener myth relies on being concerned about just one of those factors. Uh, an overdriven fastener, and in fact, any fastener, is a pathway for water. But the question is not just one of pathways. We also need a source of water. We also need uh, a force to push water along that pathway. And uh, we also need moisture sensitive materials at risk of being damaged. Now, because we build outside, some of us in crazy wet climates, 
Uh, we, we often have no shortage of source of, of a source of water, right? It's rain. Um, that's, our, that's our big source. Although we can practice source control with overhangs and drips and projections and setbacks and that kind of stuff. Um, we also have a cladding that sheds a lot of water. That's another form of source control in our, in our assemblies. Um, do we have mo moisture sensitive materials? Yes, we do. Uh, and do we have pathways? We have tons of pathways. So we've got the potential pathway of overdriven fasteners. That's a, that's a real pathway. But there are other pathways too, and I have some examples. We kind of, we already know this stuff, but our cladding attachments, so standard brick tie, like we have to fasten these to the structure. So when you fasten it, mechanically fasten it through the structure, that's a, that's a pathway. And most of the time stuff like this doesn't get sealed. This is the commercial wall um, version of a, the two part brick tie, same story. We don't seal these usually. And, um, and even, cap staples or, or cap nails. Oh, we, there's no shortage of pathways in our buildings. And it's not necessary for us to seal or be perfectly good at sealing all of these pathways to manage water in a drained wall if we're providing drainage because the drainage means that we don't have that driving force pushing water into, into the pathway. No driving force no problem. Um, it's, not, it's not enough just to have a pathway. We have to have something that pushes water into the pathway. And when we have drainage, it's pretty awesome. I feel like that makes a lot of sense because when I was younger, we would install house wrap and we would put like thousands of hammer tacker nails through. And then I'd hear the roofers up there just going crazy. So it didn't blow off over the weekend while they were gone. Yeah. And I always used to think, well, if you have, I mean, literally it could be tens of thousands on a house yeah. we build. Yeah, yeah. Why aren't we getting leaks? And like as a family, since we've been building, you know, dad started in late uh, 1978, we've lived in like 20 or 30 of the homes that we've built and we're not getting leaks. So that makes sense. Yeah, it's, um, it's intuitive when you, when you really think about it. But I think we're so conditioned to think about, and this isn't a bad thing. We, we obsess about these pathways and that it, it does matter. There, especially there's certain pathways that matter a lot, like, flashing penetrations and, and windows or penetrations too. And those provide some pretty big, pretty big pathways that we need to pay attention. Well, so, and we've gotten burned so many times over the years as an industry yeah, yeah. where you get, you know, won't say the M word, but everybody's worried about mold and, you know, it and we're, in, and we're insulating more, which means we get less drying. Mm -hmm. So it, it, that's true. You're, you're right that it's um, that we've gotten burned, but I, I think what's, What's sort of sad though about not acknowledging these four factors that require a leak is that it limits us to only one strategy to protect ourselves. If the only recourse we had to avoiding problems was sealing pathways, we'd have a real problem. But that's not our only, re like that's, we have other options available to us. It's not, it's not feasible to come back and seal every single one of your of the fasteners through your brick ties or sometimes your cladding you can't even do that like it's it's blind fastened you can't even if you wanted to you couldn't seal that stuff after um so it's not practical to do that but we have other tools at our disposal like source control so that has to do more with the design overall and then and then providing drainage which is also really essential. The, I guess the, the problem with that becomes, well, now this means that you have to show judgment, that it's pretty easy to stand somewhere and count how many fasteners are overdriven. It's, it's quite a bit more difficult as a designer on the front end to say, okay, what's the most appropriate approach to water management for the, the building that I intend to build in the climate on the site that I intend to build it on, how much drainage is required. And that answer is going to be different in Las Vegas and, uh, you know, Boston and Dallas and Houston. These are, these are going to be different answers. And so I think it's sort of natural that we substitute uh, an easier question for a more difficult question. The easy question is, oh, I got to make sure I don't have overdriven fasteners. The overdriven fasteners aren't the issue. Your water management strategy as a whole is an issue. And that means that um, what's required of us as professionals is really a lot more than 
than just um, policing whether or not a fastener is overdriven. I can, I can say too from experience over the last 10 years, the particular system that we're using, basically the, the sheathing that we have on the walls for earthquakes, we just tape the seams. So the water resistive barriers on the coating of that panel, then we tape the seams and we'll do the roof and we'll do the walls. And then now we're, you know, winter time here in the Pacific Northwest is wet. Yesterday as an example, we probably had two or three inches of rain, but I've been framing inside the house that was completely exposed to the elements. It just had the sheathing taped. Yeah. And then we're totally dry and we're not getting leaked on. So it's like, well, if it, if it works without roofing and siding, do I really have to be that concerned about it? I should yeah. be some concern, you know, and give it some real thought, but I don't have to freak out about it because if I'm dry, then I know it's working. <laughs> That's a pretty good indication. Exactly. Exactly. Okay. So I think this is a good lead into our second myth, which is that tapes are not good for long-term water management. And this is sort of a funny one. I, I'm not really sure where the, the sort of origin of, of this myth comes because we seem pretty comfortable with self-adhered membranes, right? Like we've, they've got a pretty long history of performance. We use self-adhered membranes in, in roofing applications. We're, we're pretty comfortable with that, but somehow like many self-adhered membranes in the form of tape and people like lose their mind on this stuff. <laughs> Yeah, it, it, what's interesting, so where we're framing and building right now, we're, we're pretty close to the water. And so the code on our roof is a little different than when we get into the mountains. And so just to speak to your point here, ice and water shields required in the valleys as you get closer into the mountains. And, and those products have been used for decades, at least yeah. two decades reliably. Oh, so yeah. then the idea of it going on the wall and, and really causing people to be really freaked out is like, well, but we're already doing it on top. Is it that big of a deal on the side? Yeah, I think, I mean, I suppose a lot of that potentially comes from not all tapes are the same. And we um, naturally, again, it's sort of, if you have a problem with one thing, once bitten, twice shy type of thing, like you use something and maybe that, maybe it was, maybe you picked a product that was more sensitive to substrate preparation, having perfect a perfectly prepared substrate, it didn't work. And now you're like, ah, I don't like this whole category. I don't want to deal with it ever again. But um, I think that's one area where the innovation in uh, the adhesives that we've come up with have really uh, benefited our industry a great deal. There's a huge, huge difference in how forgiving, for example, the new kind of acrylic hybrid tapes are from the more old school SBS back tapes and even the butyl backed um, tapes and, and membranes. And, uh, and even those worked quite well with good substrate preparation. Yeah, so for us, I can understand why people are skeptical because when we, I think, in fact, it was in the development that we're building in right now back in 2002, I, before that, we didn't really know about window flashing and using tapes and things like that. So, of course, I read about it in the Journal of Light Construction. I'm like, well, I've got to go out and start doing this. This is best practice. But then we would find that when we taped the windows, the next day we'd come in and the tape is, is hanging off. It's all so true. instead of peel and stick, it's like Matt Reisinger says, it's stick yeah. and peel. Yeah. yeah. I was talking to my dad today, actually. I wrote this down. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to read it while on my computer here and see if I can find it. Um, but he used a term and he told me it was old school. Okay, so you know the term for tapes that fish mouth? You know, do you, are you familiar with fish mouthing? I think so. So, it, so it's the term for, for, I hear it a lot anyway, in my corner of the industry, uh, for the top edge of a tape or, or any membrane, peeling back and creating a little fish mouth, um, <laughs> which if it's skyward facing is a problem for water. But anyway, I was talking to my dad and he used a term today that they call that, or they called it in the seventies, they called it low angle shear. So, which I think is hilarious. It's just a fancy term for saying that stuff doesn't stick. It's not sticking and it's a problem. Low, low angle shear was a real problem for some of the, some of these old school thicker tapes. Um, the, the newer tapes, the pressure sensitive adhesives 
uh, are really pretty awesome, especially when you roll them out and, um, and are unbelievably durable. My dad used one. I, I, again, I was asking him because I don't have the benefit of as many years experience as he does. He used a tape on his, his own house and um, he used it 25 years ago. And of course, because he's a building scientist, he takes the part he takes it apart every now and then to take a look. And he told me this morning, he said, looks, the tape looks as good as the day it was installed. And it's been 25 years and counting right now. So, so it, and then and it was acrylic tape that, that, uh, that he used. Interesting. Cause that was kind of our test is uh, our forklift on site. These different tapes, we'll just stick a piece on the mask. And, and then they're exposed to the weather, you know, every single day of the year for years at a time. And, and we can tell these acrylic tapes, once they're on there, you're not peeling it off. Now, the thing though, to be careful about, and this is, I guess, um, I mean, this is true for really most any building product, but what matters a great deal in terms of ensuring long-term performance. So, so I put a pin in this, to return to our myth here, our myth is tapes are not good for long-term water management. And the kernel of truth here is that, well, it matters what tape you're using. It matters whether or not you're following the manufacturer's instructions on substrate preparation. Um, th these things matter. And then this, a third thing that matters is um, to ensure long-term performance is protection from UV. So what's nice is that we've seen a lot of these. I, I know that um, a, a bunch of sort of backyard tests exist. Steve Bazek does it, Matt Reisinger does it. A bunch of our buddies do sort of similar backyard tests of, of tapes and they have them exposed for long periods of time and see how they age. Uh, that's fun for a test, but in service, if you want to, if you, if you do want to use a tape um, as part of a long-term water management strategy in a building, you absolutely can do so. However, it really ought to be protected from UV. And so that means being really careful if you're using an open joint cladding system that you have something, something else there to protect from, from UV. Because those tapes, um, those tapes that, that will help you get the best performance out of out of um, out of a tape system. This is also true. This is similarly true for fluid membranes. Um, I, it's true for any membrane. I, all of our building materials. For if we're if we're looking at water management long term, UV is a uh, is a big deal. Yeah, we've learned that one the hard way. We had a, a deck that we built. This is a custom home, man, 10, 11 years ago during the downturn, and we had from the bottom of the siding right above the deck. There was just a small gap, right, so we wouldn't wick water up. Yep. But you could just see the tape. Huh. And the manufacturer said, you got to get it covered. So we thought we were fine. Uh, I think the homeowner caught it. So we ended up tucking metal to protect it from the sun. You know, now 10 years later, we'd probably be heading out there to do some major repair if we didn't take that step. Yeah, it's a critical spot too. Um, bottom of the wall. People get, the bottom of the wall always gets beat up. So it's, uh, it's good, to, good to protect that stuff from, from UV. Important. Well, because, I, I, you know, when you mentioned that about the, um, you know, this is kind of secondary to the video itself. But as I was listening to you talk about the UV, I know that I can't entirely blame the tapes. If I don't install them correctly, like the, like the rollers, you know, and I get people that will message me and they're like, do you actually roll the tape? And I'm like, always, always, always roll the tape. Yes. You know, our family business has been around for 40 years and I would like to stay employed, so I want to do a good job. We're That's so funny. Tape. That's so funny that you get that. I get it too. Do you actually do this? Yes. Yes, I do. It matters. It's important. Yeah. I don't just do it for Instagram. I, I do it because I should do it. <laughs> oh, that's funny. That's funny. Yeah. Um, it's, it's interesting. There's um, sealants work in a similar way also. Like silicone, for example, is a fantastic joint sealer. It's, it's wonderful but it requires unbelievably attentive substrate preparation to function well long-term in tons and tons and tons of conditions. Um, butyl, you can slap that stuff onto almost anything and it works, but it's not, um, it's not as durable as um, a silicone and, and won't hold up to UV as well either. So it's, a, I, I think, a really interesting 
feat of engineering, coming up with products that are both durable and relatively forgiving. And I think this is actually like the golden era of tapes right now, where we can have, where we have a lot of fantastic adhesives and options now for materials that stick very well to what we want them to stick to with um, minimal additional work. Like sometimes it doesn't require priming, it, but it requires rolling, that kind of that kind of stuff. Also, this is super common. There's we've been using sheet adhesives in buildings for a long time. And especially in commercial construction, like find a see if you can build a building without that. Uh, you, you need sometimes the spanning capacity of of um, of a sheet good, uh, which is a longer tape. It's uh, we, we've this technology is not new. It's um, it's and it certainly is um, uh, not just possible to use for long term water management, but often necessary. Yeah, I was thinking about this, too. You know, if I put myself in other people's shoes, why why am I skeptical? And I and I, I I'll be honest, I've had some bad experiences with tapes and then we figured out we weren't installing it correct. But even if we did, sometimes it didn't work the way we wanted it to work in the past. But doing research on all this before we pick the particular system that we use, I started to look around and realize we're relying on engineered wood products to keep our house up in an earthquake or a hurricane. It, it's those wood fibers are bonded with adhesives. Um, the glue lamb that's going to support three yeah. stories that I'm standing on. All those laminations are made or they're bonded together with glue. Yeah. And so like my windshield is attached with adhesives and it doesn't leak and it's outside all the time. And I get on an airplane and I know that some of those components are bonded with adhesive. So I think sometimes just understanding that it's not just limited to the building industry or the products we're using, but like we're putting our life in the hands of these adhesives when we drive our car or we fly on an airplane. I gotta say one of the most shocking things for me when I started like after architecture school and actually working in the practice of architecture and being on job sites was the sheer amount of sticky stuff we use like everywhere. <laughs> it's incredible. It's just really kind of cool. Okay. So we like tapes. Uh, we can certainly integrate tapes into a, a good long-term water management system related to this is the question of reverse laps. So reverse laps happen anytime you don't shingle lap something. So shingle like a roof, um, you know, the, uphill or upslope portion laps over the lower portion and you get water that cascades down. Um, so if you don't do that, you have a reverse lap. So this happens with all kinds of sticky membranes. This happens in roofing applications and wall applications. This happens all kinds of places. Uh, the question is how big a deal is it? Is it an enormous problem? Um, yes or no? I would what like to know. I would like to know because every time I post something on Instagram where we're installing siding and flashing and then taping it to the wall, I'll already have the same tape. Sometimes we don't know what the siding is. So by the time we go and then flash the metal, sometimes we're actually taping to the tape that was already on the wall. And yeah. I get called out every time for the reverse. Really? Oh, that's funny. Yeah. That's funny that you get called out for that. Yeah. Am I wrong? <laughs> no, you're not. Uh, so here's a term that I think you will find helpful in, in helping to answer some of these people, um, that a lot of the particularly newer membranes, so fluid membranes, a, a lot of the fluid membranes work this way, and a lot of the acrylic tapes work this way, and they are what's called self-terminating which means that if you roll them, if it's in the case of a, of a tape that needs rolling or, um, or in, even in the absence of rolling them in the case of a, of a fluid, uh, they do not need any special edge treatment along that top, that top edge, skyward facing edge, uh, for them to remain fully bonded to whatever the substrate is. Now, obviously there's limitations, right? It matters what you stick whatever it is too, but, um, but that's the term for that is self-terminating. Um, now it's not bad to use membranes that are not self-terminating. We use them all the time. So a classic example is, you know, you've got deck waterproofing and you run it up the wall. A lot of times that needs a mechanical termination. You have a term bar to make sure it doesn't slide back down the wall or something like that. That's, that's not uncommon. Um, but not all membranes need that kind of mechanical termination. Some of them are self-terminating and are just fine 
by themselves. I'm sure we'll splice in some images to, to show exactly that. But that's the, that's the term for that. Uh, now, the trouble is with reverse laps, again, kernel of truth in this, in this myth, reverse laps can be an enormous problem if you're using a, a thicker kind of membrane that isn't sufficiently bonded along its top edge to whatever you're sticking, you're sticking it onto. So an example might be a, um, um, for flashing windows, sometimes people use a butyl backed or an SBS backed um, sheet good, and they'll, they'll have a, a skyward facing edge to that. And, and those really can peel off. And especially if it's at a window, now it's not just peeling off at some random spot in the wall, it's peeling off right where you've got an opening to the interior. So that could be a really big deal. Um, so typically in those cases, what we do is we, the manufacturer, depends on what, what you're using, will recommend a particular edge treatment to ensure that that doesn't happen. So a lot of times that means buttering up the top edge with sealant. Um, sometimes it means sticking a, a smaller piece of acrylic tape at the, at the top of a, of a different kind of membrane. Um, but most of the times we do this with, uh, we butter the, the top edge with, with sealant. Sometimes even manufacturers will say, we'll staple the membrane in place. That is my least favorite approach. Uh, but uh, anyway, there's ways that we can deal with reverse laps and many, many cases where reverse laps, I mean, we call them a reverse lap, I guess technically they are, but they, they don't have this sort of performance implication that um, a, when, when the material in question is self-terminating. Yeah, so, I've always kind of wondered that because I'm putting a tape on the wall. To, let, let's say I'm taping my metal Z-flashing over window trim to the wall. And there's already right. some tape on the wall but that edge of the tape goes around the whole building for all my scenes. How am I causing myself a problem by, you know, reverse lapping just under it and going over the top when basically the rest of that scene is exposed or has a... You're not, you're not. And you're also probably, I mean, this, the second reason in your, in the example you gave is you're also probably already dried in with your window anyway. <laughs> yeah. um, so even if you did get water underneath, you'd be fine. But that's sort of, not related, that's more specific to the design, not related to the conversation that we're having here about reverse laps, but your, your logic is, is sound. We do this all the time. This is, um, this is not a big indictment. Reverse laps are a lot more common than people, um, than people maybe think of when they're at the drafting table actually drawing something. It would be extremely difficult for a contractor to perfectly sequence a job to avoid all reverse laps. Yeah, I, I, I think just, that's- I a, couldn't even imagine it. That's a, that's a great point because like, if there's anything that 2020 taught us, we couldn't necessarily get all the materials when we wanted them. And so it just completely interrupted the order that we did things. Oh, but exactly. then I wanna keep things as simple as possible so that when we hire new guys, they can, they can get our particular system, the products we're using, our way of installing them, that they can get that and memorize it quickly. And so if I can explain to them, look, avoid reverse laps whenever you can. But those, there's going to be times where you can't for whatever reason. Don't worry about it in those cases with, with the system that we're using. Exactly. Okay, so we talked about substrate preparation, or I talked about substrate preparation. Tim, what do you think about substrate preparation in, in conjunction with, obviously, adhesives? And what's reasonable, what's not reasonable? Do you find the manufacturer's requirements are, are reasonable for, for attentive practitioners or are they a little bit silly? Are they mostly just CYA recommendations? What's, I think I know what you're gonna say, but what say you? So I, I would say for us, it's not a big deal. Um, the hard part of the year is of course the time where basically here in Washington from October through April is when it's the most challenging. That's when the, the rain is the heaviest or the most common. So what we've done to just adjust kind of the way that we build is we, honestly, we have the guys out here, sometimes literally like we did this today, we're like, what does the Doppler show? And we'll keep the materials covered and we'll, we'll maybe time it in such a way that if we know rain's coming, we'll hurt, like, when, like the wall behind me as an example. We did not know if we were gonna get rain today. We didn't. 
we started to feel some raindrops. So as we laid the sheeting before we lifted the wall, we decided to nail off the seams first so that those could get taped. Oh, I so see. We, yeah. Yep. So we kept the panels dry. We only bring them out when we're ready to use them. And then we nail the seams and tape those right away. So for and, you, that I did not anticipate you saying that, actually. So for you, water getting, I mean, maybe I should have. So for you, having a dry substrate is more of an issue than having a clean substrate. <laughs> yeah, I mean, clean's easy. We, we have battery power bl blowers. We have yeah. backpack, you know, gas power blowers. You can broom off the wall. You know, we've got the little hand broom. So that part of it's super easy. Well, it's, you're it's really the wet. Wet for us. You're also using you're also using zip for the most part. So you've got you've got a coating already. If you're if yeah. you're using getting something to stick to, um, I, you know, for instance, I mentioned sticking to um, you know using an SBS or butyl backed membrane. A lot of times, you, like you can't clean the substrate in the same way. You need to use a primer. Um, so yeah, you're, so you're not having to use primers. No, I, I guess really the, the two answers then to your question would be, we picked a product that requires almost nothing. And then we just try to use that product when it's not going to get wet, which takes sometimes a little bit of creativity. But honestly, we've been for 11 years, we've been doing this and rarely do we have to get back on a ladder to install tape. We install the panels and tape before the walls go up, eliminate that ladder work, except in some very rare cases. Like, to be honest, they've been forecasting rain here from yesterday morning through like next Wednesday. But as you can see, it's dry right now. So today we were able to sheet that wall and lift it and get it taped. So timing, timing is everything. Well, timing. And I think this is actually a perfect kind of wrap up to our discussion. It's not just timing. That's everything, but context is everything too. I think one of the things I enjoy most about conversations like this, and you know, we pick a provocative title about busting, busting myths. Um, but really, I think it's um, uh, what we're responding to is oversimplification in our industry and that neither of the three things that we talked about today can be reduced to a simple uh, prohibition on building practices. Context matters. Uh, design, the design matters, the climate matters, the type of environment you're building in, what resources you have, uh, and then personal preference. So there's tons of room for personal preference in all of these. Uh, so I think that's a, that's a pretty good, uh, pretty good conclusion to all of this stuff. So myth number one, overdriven fasteners are usually not really bad. Myth number two, tapes are just fine for a myth corrected, I guess I should say. Tapes are often a very important part of long-term water management strategy, contrary to being a problem. And myth number three, reverse laps can be important, but are not necessarily important if, uh, if you're attentive and uh, treat your... Um, follow manufacturer directions and your own common sense in how you install this. Okay, so these questions that Christine especially just answered were exactly the same questions I kept asking her on Instagram. <laughs> you guys would ask me or people would ask me and I'm like, I'm not, I'm a framer. I'll just DM Christine. So I really appreciate you taking the time, first of all, to explain them to me and then be able to do it now here for IBS. Well, thanks. That's super fun. And I, um, I love learning about the parts of the industry that are just adjacent my area of expertise. None of us is uh, an expert in all of these things. So it's really nice to be able to learn from each other. And actually, with that in mind, I think that as fun a conversation and, and uh, in as much depth as we've gotten to get in our back and forth right here, I am certain that there is more to talk about, about even just these three uh, myths and maybe even some others that um, some of our audience members have. So I'd love it if we could open it up for some questions from them.